Hello, everybody. My name is Beth Strausser, and I work in the policy office at the National Science Foundation. It is my pleasure to welcome you to another session of the NSF Virtual Grants Conference. Uh, I am now pleased to announce this session, which will cover programs in the Directorate for Social, Behavioral, and Economic Sciences. This session will be presented by Betty Tuller and May Yuan. So take it away, Betty and May. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the presentation about the Social, Behavioral, and Economic Sciences Directorate at NSF. My name is Betty Tuller. I'm also joined by Mei Huan, who is in a different division within this directorate. Well, that will become clear as we go. I've been at NSF now, well, longer than I have fingers, for about 15 years now. I came as a rotator. NSF has, as you may have heard, some people who come for two or three years at a time, others who are permanent personnel. If any of you of your faculty are interested in coming as a rotator, it's a fabulous experience and you bring back a lot of information back to your institution. My primary program at NSF is Perception, Action and Cognition. Um, I am a cognitive scientist by training. I came here from Florida Atlantic University, which is one of the state universities in Florida. But as a program director, you also get involved in a lot of interdirectorate programs. Um, you really need a lot of broad experience and broad knowledge, and you'll see that within the presentation. So NSF, as you've already heard, supports many different fields that might be relevant to the social, behavioral, and economic sciences. You can see this is a slide that's showing all of the directorates, but the kind of work that we fund within SBE, SBE, Social, Behavioral and Economic Sciences, really is filtered into many of these other directorates as well. Our focus is a little bit different, however. So within the Directorate for Social, Behavioral and Economic Sciences, our focus is basic research on people and society. And this is across all different scales from cells to human societies and on different time spans. So for example, human behavior across the lifespan in development, as well as across um, archeological span. We also look at social organizations, right? Anything that involves humans, how social, economic, political, cultural, and environmental factors not only affect the lives and behavior of people, but also how people in turn shape these forces within their world. A little bit about the organization or structure of the directorate. At the top, we have the assistant director, who is the head of the directorate, Sylvia Butterfield, and her deputy, Antoinette Winkler Prince. Below that, we have three divisions the Division of Behavioral and Cognitive Sciences, where I'm from, the Division of Social and Economic Sciences, where May is from. And we also have a third division, the National Center for Science and Engineering Statistics, that's not a research-oriented division, um, but a lot of the products that it creates are used quite a bit within our sciences. There's also the Office of Multidisciplinary Activities, which I'll talk about as well. But underneath this structure, you have the myriad program directors as well as the organizational staff that helps evaluate research proposals, get the reviews in, decide what to fund, and gets the money out the door. Just a little bit of background information for the kind of impact that we actually have within our directorate. In fiscal year 2022, we spent $286 million on research awards. Um, there were 3,500 proposals and 770 research awards. These numbers, I mean, the percentages don't work out perfectly if you're trying to do your little calculations because we also make awards like uh, doctoral dissertation research improvement grants or conference awards, and those are not included in these numbers. But the research awards have supported 5,500 people across 500 different institutions. 
uh, and that includes senior personnel, principal investigators, other senior personnel, other professionals, postdocs, grad students, and many undergraduate students as well. In order to do this, we rely on our colleagues out in the field to do reviews of proposals. You can see for 770 awards, there are 17,000 proposal reviews that have been generated. Uh, this NSF money supports 63% of federal funding for academic research in our sciences, in the social and behavioral sciences. So I'm going to go through each of the divisions a little bit. I'm going to go fairly quickly because I assume you can read when you go to the web pages, but I just want to give you somewhat different understanding of the organizational structure and also the types of things that are covered. So in behavioral and cognitive sciences, which will be referred to as BCS, we support research within the psychological, linguistic, geographic, and anthropological sciences. So here I've listed all of the standing programs within BCS, and they're sort of quasi-organized into these groups. So the psychological and linguistic sciences includes things like cognitive neuroscience, developmental sciences, which is not just kids, it's from infants all the way through old age. Linguistics, dynamic language infrastructure, perception, action and cognition, my own program, science of learning and augmented intelligence and social psychology. So you can see these are all kind of united within the psychological or linguistic sciences. Within the geographic sciences, we have human environment and geographical sciences and human networks and data science. But there is, of course, overlap across these two groups. And then the third group, archaeology, biological anthropology, and cult cultural anthropology. Also, they cohere kind of as a group, but the connections between these three groups are really very strong. We co-review together, which I'll describe later. We also co-fund together. Often the best research is within the spaces across programs. You'll notice that some of these programs, like archaeology, have a little asterisk next to them. Those are the programs that support doctoral dissertation research improvement grants, DDRI. It's important to note that these doctoral dissertation research improvement awards are only to improve the research. They don't provide stipends for the doctoral students. Lots of other programs don't support DDRIs, but we do often support doctoral students within the context of, of a grant to a principal investigator at an institution. So, for example, in my own program, Perception, Action, Cognition, we don't do separate DDRIs, but we almost always, in every award that we make, there is support for graduate students there. These are known as standing programs, but even the standing programs change, right? So this one, Human Networks and Data Science, is fairly new. So I'm going to talk about it a little bit as an example of a change in a standing program. And it's often difficult for people to get current information. They assume they know what the programs are. But if you don't check the current websites, then you're missing out on really the cutting edge programs. So Human Networks and Data Science was created a couple of years ago. Anytime you see this, NSF 23-568 or NSF with some number after it, that means there is a solicitation with a lot more information about what the program is looking for and how to apply, right? So you should click on that and you would get the whole verbiage. I often tell principal investigators or potential investigators, print that out. I don't um, enjoy wasting trees, but this isn't a waste because you have to follow the solicitation. So human networks and data science, also referred to as HANDS, H-N-D-S. It uh, grew out of the realization that so much more data, big data, was available to our sciences, but wasn't being used in a coherent way, right? So there were a lot of opportunities presented by the, all of this big data and by the emerging network sciences as applied to the sciences within social, behavioral, and economic science. And we wanted to grease the wheels for that. So this program has two different tracks. 
Both of them had budget maximums of $1.2 million. The first track is HANS infrastructure, and the infrastructure part is to develop things like databases, um, shared data resources, shared data analytic, analytics, and so on for the community. Uh, the HANS program will review those and fund some of them across many, many different disciplines within social, behavioral, and economic sciences. The second track, HANS R or HANS Research, funds research in the standing programs, so in all of those other programs, that also incorporates a data analytics piece or a, a data, uh, big data or network science piece. So this kind of co-review, co-funding can enhance and increase the potential within the basic sciences of, of the other standing programs in a particular direction. And the direction is one that exploits the opportunities provided by big data, data science, and data analytics and network science. The social, behavioral, and economic sciences has a second directorate, social and economic sciences, SES. SES invests in studies of how societies, organizations, and economies function. So the way BCS was more on the people scale, this scales up to the more organizational scale within SES. Again, it's not a hard and fast distinction. There's a lot of overlap among programs. But SES looks at things like how decisions are made, not just by individuals, but by institutions and organizations how institutions or organizations function, and how progress is um, greased, right? How it's pursued, how people function within these larger organizations. The programs include accountable institutions and behavior, decision, decision risk and management sciences, economics, law and science, methodology, measurement and statistics, security and preparedness, science of organizations, science and technology studies, science of science. How is the science enterprise done? A secure and trustworthy cyberspace and sociology. Again, the programs with asterisks are the ones that support doctoral dissertation research improvement grants. Now notice if you looked at this a few years ago, it would look quite different. There was a program called political science. Political science has evolved into two separate areas accountable institutions and behavior, and security and preparedness. So you really have to look each year to make sure that you're up to date on which programs exist and what their requirements are. So I'm gonna highlight just one program within the SES division, and that is Secure and Trustworthy Cyberspace. Again, you've got this NSF number, that means there is a program solicitation, a fairly large program announcement that you can click on and go to and read the requirements. But one of the reasons that I'm going to talk about this is that although it is, it's housed in social and economic sciences in our directorate, it's also a very cross directorate program within NSF. So it deals with the fragility and the vulnerabilities of cyberspace. We've all read every day in the news about how um, our internet has real issues with regard to privacy, with regard to bias, with regard to trust, hacking, all this kind of stuff. And in order to achieve a really secure cyberspace, we have to address lots of very challenging scientific and engineering problems. But those aren't only hardware or software problems. Yeah, they involve hardware and software, but they also involve aspects of human behavior and human choice, how humans use this system. So this is a joint program with social and behavioral sciences, but also computing, communication and information sciences in the size directorate, computer and information science and engineering directorate, um, aspects of engineering within the engineering directorate, the education directorate, and the math and physical sciences directorate. So it's run as a joint cross-directorate program, although um, some of the primary program directors are in 
the social economic and the SES division within SBE. It is alphabet soup, uh, but you get used to it. We also, as I mentioned, have within the SBE directorate, an Office of Multidisciplinary Activities, or SMA. Uh, their purview is primarily under programs that support undergraduate training, postdoctoral training, and capacity building, right? In particular, we've been interested in capacity building at minority serving institutions, and I will talk about that in more depth in a minute. And also dealing with the science behind the ethical conduct, conduct of scientific research. So it's not programs to um, conduct scientific research ethically. They fund the basic science research to figure out how to promote the ethical conduct of scientific research. The same here with the science of broadening participation. Those are not programs that in and of themselves broaden participation. Instead, SMA funds research to figure out how to broaden participation. We are a science directorate and we believe the science, okay? So the SMA programs are Build and Broaden, which is essentially for increasing uh, research at minority serving institutions, ethical and responsible research, research experiences for undergraduates, postdoctoral research fellowships, and the science of broadening participation. So for the SBE postdoctoral research fellowships, again, you have a program description here where you can get a lot more information. This is an interesting program because it supports postdoctoral opportunities, opportunities for recent postdocs. Uh, they have to have a sponsor. You have to have a plan of what you're gonna do but the funds go to the postdoctoral fellow, right? So if you're applying for a postdoc to work with a particular investigator, that investigator does not have to already have funding for you. This is funding for your research in order to work with your host sponsor. There are two tracks. One track is for fundamental research. In Again, it has to be within the SBE sciences. But another track is aimed at broadening participation. So broadening participation of postdocs for people, for groups who are underrepresented in our sciences. Another program that's been uh, very su successful, but we really want to enhance is called Build and Broaden. Build and Broaden supports basic research in the SBE sciences by people at minority serving institutions or people working with others at minority serving institutions. Uh, in order to determine if you are in fact in a minority serving institution or if your colleagues are, uh, there are lists that are published every year. It is updated every year. Um, and we really are hoping to get more proposals from either single principal investigators who are based at minority serving institutions multiple co-investigators from one or more minority serving institutions, right? Because building capacity really is stronger when you have more than one investigator often, but also from principal investigators who are not affiliated with minority serving institutions, but who really collaborate with colleagues, with investigators and senior personnel from minority serving institutions. And a primary goal must be, how is this project going to enhance research partnerships or enhance capacity building with at least one minority serving institution? So if most of the money is going to the not minority serving institution, it's probably not going to fly as a build and broaden proposal, right? This The proposal has to have as a primary goal building capacity at the minority serving institution by virtue of the collaboration. Now, I also mentioned this third division within SBE, and that's the National Center for Science and Engineering Statistics. The National Center for Science and Engineering Statistics 
collects and reports data on the science and engineering workforce and U.S. competitiveness and all kinds of things, sometimes directed by Congress. It's one of 13 principal st statistical agencies within the federal government, and it's overseen by the chief statistician within the White House Office of Management and Budget. It is not a direct granting research division the way BCS and SES are. However, it produces reports that can be extremely helpful to others within the field. This is just a list of those reports and surveys. The ones that are, are really helpful, I think, for some of our scientists are things like the survey of doctoral recipients and the survey of earned doctorates. So um, how many doctorates in our sciences are coming out, right? How about grad students, postdocs, where are they going? How many of them are still there 10 years later and so on? Now, that was like a really quick survey of programs within the directorate, within social behavioral and economic sciences, and one, secure and trustworthy cyberspace, that reached into other directorates. There are many, many cross-directorate programs, and all of the program directors at NSF are involved not only in their own home program, or sometimes we call them standing programs, although they do change, but also in these cross-directorate programs, which often change more quickly, right? They're often there for only a few years and then either get revamped or they may sunset or they may get continued. I'm gonna give you just a few examples of cross-directorate programs uh, because often people don't find out about these things as easily as the standing programs, which already have some kind of institutional memory for people. So, a fairly new one is called Centers for Research and Innovation in Science, the Environment and Society, or CRISES. Uh, strengthening American infrastructure that is based within SBE is how do we use information about people and people networks to strengthen the infrastructure. Incorporating human behavior in epidemiological models. Integrative strategies for understanding neural and cognitive systems that grew out of the BRAIN initiative. A fairly new one, Dynamics of Integrated Socio-Environmental Systems, I'll go through in a bit more detail, and Accelerating Research Translation, right, which is connected to the new Directorate on Translation, Innovation, and Partnerships, or TIPS. I'm not going to go through all of these, but I'm just giving you a, a, a sort of taste for the breadth of research that the SBE sciences are involved in, and that just looking at the standing programs is probably insufficient for any PI who really wants to find areas for funding for their research. So Dynamics of Integrated Socioeconomic Systems, or DICES, it studies the processes and interactions between the human and particular system. It grew out of a previous cross-directorate program called Coupled Natural and Human Systems. Um, and it's sort of changed the focus of that a little bit. The budget maximum is 1.6 million. So these cross-directorate initiatives tend to have larger awards than the standing programs can possibly give. In part, that's because they're explicitly interdisciplinary and multi multidisciplinary and usually have interdisciplinary teams. Interdisciplinary teams tend to have several senior investigators and bigger budgets, right? More students and so on. So DICES also is composed of interdisciplinary teams and they might come from geography, uh, human perception, engineering, all kinds of things, right? It just depends on the area that you're proposing to work in. DICES also funds research coordination networks, which we haven't talked about yet. Research coordination networks, that's money not for the science itself, but it's money to enhance collaboration, especially across disciplines. Um, you might have a good idea and you might know that there are people from other disciplines that really need to be involved, 
but you, I mean, there's a human component to these kinds of interdisciplinary teams. You have to meet the right people. You have to plan. You have to do work together before you really are at the point where you could put in a full-blown research proposal. So these research coordinations are very useful. They're also extremely good for students, right? Because they get exposure to work from different disciplines and get to learn to come to a problem from very different aspects, from very different perspectives. We not only have cross-directorate programs, we also are involved in cross-agency programs. I've listed two of them here. One has been around for a long time now, Collaborative Research in Computational Neuroscience. It involves the National Science Foundation. It also involves many different um, institutes within the National Institutes of Health and the Department of Energy. There are opportunities for parallel international funding from the science agencies in Germany, France, Israel, Japan, Spain. And also you can have more than two countries involved. Basically, for all of these countries, the review is done by the National Science Foundation, and they accept the end process of our review. Um, if you have collaborators in, let's say, the U.S. and France, the French National Science Foundation, essentially, the ANR, will fund the French portion, and we fund the U.S. portion, or the NIH or DOE funds the U.S. portion, but it's really one proposal collaborative, not across universities within the US this time, but now across countries. For CRCNS, Collaborative Research and Computational Neuroscience, the work can be all within the US, but it's this opportunity to have parallel international funding is also very helpful. A second cross-agency program that's only within the US is smart health and biomedical research in the era of artificial intelligence and advanced data science. That's quite a mouthful. We just call it smart health. Smart health involves uh, several directorates within NSF, SBE, Science, Computer and Information Science and Engineering, the Engineering Directorate, and Math and Physical Sciences. But it also involves many different institutes within NIH. Uh, Smart Health supports high-risk, high-reward approaches to questions in the biomedical and public health communities. So how to build, I mean, better training for nurses or how to improve the health of shift workers and um, how to get computational software that will read radiology reports better because it's including aspects of human visual perception. These are the kinds of questions that Smart Health attacks. Okay, so rather than talking about specific program areas, I'm going to talk a little bit about the kinds of awards or mechanisms in NSF speak that are available. We've already talked about the Doctoral Dissertation Research Improvement Grants, DDRIGs. Remember, that is not for stipends. That is only to support costs incurred from the research itself. We also have EAGERS. EAGER stands for Early Concept Grants for Exploratory Research. It's proposals for work where someone might have a really high risk, a really transformative idea, but they need funds to get proof of concept or some pilot data. Uh, these are smaller awards. They're only a couple of years. I will say that different programs vary in how likely or how eager they are to give eager awards. Uh, for many of us, eager awards, awards are not that much smaller than our regular, our regular research awards. And um, eagers do not go through, don't necessarily go through external review, right? And we really do like the peer review also for these early concept grants. However, that mechanism is there for those really special ideas. There are also rapid awards. That's for work where the data is ephemeral and can quickly disappear. So something like um, cognitive changes immediately after natural disasters. That would be a rapid award where if you wait six months or eight months and you go through the whole peer review process, those data aren't going to be there anymore. 
I know we did a lot of uh, rapid awards for the COVID-19 epidemic, right? Trying to figure out quickly, quickly, quickly how to, to pivot to online education and so on. There are also conference awards, which tend to be smaller, of course. Um, research coordination networks we've talked about. A very big initiative within NSF are the career awards. That's for early career investigators. Uh, there's a different deadline. There is It goes into a separate submission that then gets parceled out to the different programs. It really makes sense for people, if they're thinking of a, a career proposal, to talk to the program director or email the program director of the program that you think would be the most relevant because that's likely to be where your career proposal ends up. Uh, Mid-career advancement is fairly new. It's only a few years old, and that's for mid-career investigators, usually just before tenure. Um, it's often for people who want to get new techniques, new education for themselves, have their research pivot a little, work with someone else on a part-time basis, uh, there's there aren't a lot of opportunities to expand your own uh, education and your own knowledge base when you've already been a faculty member for five, four, five, six years, right? Me career advancement allows people to do this in very targeted ways. And then we have facilitating facilitating research at primarily undergraduate institutions. There's not a separate pot of money for that. Uh, but we are very cognizant of spreading taxpayer dollars, uh, not only across different kinds of investigators, and uh, but also across different kinds of institutions, at primarily undergraduate institutions. One of the things that we really look at is how is this research award going to give the undergraduates a spectacular research experience, given the limitations of, um, you know, potentially not having the same facilities or whatever. So we really do look at the education of the undergraduates in that. Other useful terms, uh, we have these things called dear colleague letters. Dear, you'll see one when we go through the searches. Dear colleague letters are identifying areas that NSF wants to enhance funding of, but it, there is no separate pot of money attached to it. Okay. Uh, sometimes, dear colleague, letters are just informational, right? So uh, SBE has put out a dear colleague letter trying to explain the concept of broader impacts in a little bit more detail. So dear colleague letters are informative. They're not actually funding mechanisms, usually. Other useful terms, sometimes you'll see on the program websites or the solicitations, you'll see there's a deadline. That means by five o'clock your time, Proposal has to be in. It might be a target date. Target date is a little bit looser. Um, if, a pro, if a principal investigator needs a little bit more time, they can email the program director and often get a little bit of, of wiggle room for when they submit a proposal. And then there's a target window, which says, it, let's say you can submit your proposals between, for example, June 1st and June 15th. Well, that means please don't submit before June 1st. And June 15th is a deadline. So the end of a target window is a deadline, not a target date. We also have program solicitations, those numbers that I showed you, like NSF 22 some other number. Um, they're also called program announcements. They're an in-depth description of the program, but not all programs have them. My program, for example, does not have a program solicitation. We only have the program description, which is basically the verbiage on the web page. If there is no link to an NSF like 22-something or 23-something, then there is no program solicitation or program announcement. Okay, so how to find programs. Um, there is a new NSF funding search to look for programs um, that might fit the research that you're trying to propose. Uh, it's nsf.gov slash funding slash opportunities. It's really much easier than the old website. 
You can also do an award search to see what programs have given awards based on keywords to things that might be similar to what you would like to propose, right? That will give you a list, and I'll show you this, it'll give you a list of um, titles, abstracts, and a lot more information in order to help you hone your search to the right program. You can also subscribe to NSF announcements and newsletters because that'll give you information about new programs, cross-directorate cross programs, um, and also things like webinars that make the information involved in submitting a proposal much clearer. Okay, because really the hardest thing at NSF, in my opinion, is finding the right program for your research. If you find the right program, your likelihood of getting funded is far higher than if you're in the wrong program, because then it might be fabulous research, but if it doesn't fit the mission of the program, then it's not going to get funded there. So this is the NSF funding search tool, the first thing that I mentioned. Um, it comes to this homepage, and there's a bunch of things that you can do. One is to filter by directorate. So if you're doing behavioral science, then you might want to filter by social behavioral and economic sciences directorate. It's also quite interesting here, you can filter by education level. So you, if you're an undergraduate, a grad student, a postdoc, or an invest, a senior investigator, you can restrict your search to those levels. And that's quite helpful. Once you do this, you get a list of results with clickable links, right? So here, I don't remember what I searched for, but here, um, one of the results was Human Networks and Data Science, which is a program that we've talked about. And you can click that and it would take you to the program web page, right? It also here has a clickable link to the program solicitation, if there is one. Notice the next hit is to a dear colleague letter. So it's not a program, right? It, but it is giving you information that could be very useful and very germane to whatever it is that you're trying to find out. If you click and go to the program webpage, there's a lot of information there, right? So here you have upcoming due dates. It also tells you if it's a target date or a deadline, right? This is a target date, which means that if your sponsored research office is totally overwhelmed or you've had COVID for three weeks and haven't been able to get out of bed, you can write to one of the program directors and ask for a little bit of extra time. They may be able to give it to you, they may not, but the opportunity is there. You can also see who the program directors are. Note that when it says program assistant or program specialist, that is not a program director, that's support staff, okay? So write to the program directors. Also very helpful is at the bottom of the, every program webpage, it says browse projects funded by this program. That gives you a really good idea about the type of things that that program is going to fund. So if you click there, it takes you to this page, which would be, a list of, of awards that that program has made. Another way to get here is the advanced award search that I talked about before. Here, you can put in particular information, like if you know that there are people who are funded by NSF who do work similar to you, you can search using their name and search who, which programs have funded them. You might not know particular investigators, but here this says keyword. You can put in keywords about your research area or research topic. You can search active awards or awards that are already ex expired within a particular date range and see if you can figure out the best program for your work. Either way, browsing things funded from this program by that bottom link or using the advanced award search, you wind up with a list of, of awards that have been made. Note that I'm saying awards, not proposals. Proposals are not public. Awards are public, okay? So here, I know it's impossible to read this, but I'm just going to point out a couple of things. 
Each of these blue lines is actually the title of an award. And then there's information about who the principal investigator was, if there's a co-PI, the organization, um, how much the award was for, and so on. But you can click on the title, click on any of these titles, and you'll get to the abstract page. I stretched this out, hoping you can read it, because there's a lot of information on here that's extremely useful. The first thing is um, the abstract is here attached on the bottom. I cut it off because there's no way you could read it. But read the abstract. Make sure that it's in the same general area as the work that you're trying to propose. You can see who the program director was, right? Here you can see the start date and the end date. So you can see how long the awards are that they typically give, right? Uh, many programs typically will give awards that are only about three years. Some, like this one is from developmental science, if it's a longitudinal study, will give awards that are a little bit longer. You can also see the awarded amount. At NSF, anytime you see a dollar amount, we're talking total dollars. So that's direct costs plus all of the fringe benefits and indirect costs. Okay. People who are used to NIH are used to seeing the awarded amount as only the direct costs. That is not true at, at NSF. Okay. You also can see the principal investigator, their email address. Um, and so on. But it's down here where it says NSF programs. Here it just says DS, Developmental Sciences. Sometimes you'll have more than one program listed. That means this particular award was co-funded by more than one program. And it's a hint to you as an investigator, go look at this other program also, because there was something about this that they also were interested in, right? Maybe that program is more relevant for you as the primary program. So if there's more than one program listed, it meant it, the proposal was probably co-reviewed, but definitely co-funded. So more than one program gave money. But what is this co-review? Co-review means that you can ask for review by more than one program. If you feel that you, your work is really highly relevant to more than one program, you can ask for review by more than one program. Note that I'm saying request review. It is only a request. Whether or not it gets co-reviewed is up to the program director. Sometimes it's not co-reviewed for really not very interesting reasons, like their timing is too off, right? Um, some programs don't co-review. Many of them do, right? How do you request co-review? Well, you can choose different programs on the cover page. In research.gov, I think they're called units of interest or organizational units. So there is a way to request more than one program to look at this. The managing program will be whatever you click first. Okay. Another way you can be co-reviewed is that the program directors can identify proposals that they think would be um, better reviewed if it were a co-review. So in my program, Perception, Action, and Cognition, we often get work on that's really psycholinguistics. So we would ask linguistics program to co-review. Or if people are proposing to do um, heavy brain imaging to answer a particular question that is, in fact, relevant to our program, we might ask the Cognitive Neuroscience program to also co-review. And then they can either accept the co-review or not. Now, uh, it could be that both programs really like the proposal and both programs then kick in money for it. It might be that neither program really likes it or funds it. But what happens if only one program likes it? I mean, people are afraid often that this is kind of double jeopardy, but it isn't because we look at why the other program didn't like it. So in the case of the, the psycholinguistics proposal, for example, let's say my program really likes it, ranks it very highly, but linguistics does not. It might be that they ranked it as not a competitive proposal, not because there was anything wrong with it, but because it didn't fit the mission of that program, right? It doesn't further linguistic theory or linguistic science. But if they say there's nothing linguistically naive about it, I'm actually 
less hesitant about funding this. I'm more in favor of funding it because I know that from this other perspective, they haven't done anything wrong. Reviews from multiple perspectives usually leads to better science. And we often will work with investigators in order to improve things so that we're not tunnel visioned or siloed. So the bottom line for submitting a proposal to any initiative, any program at NSF is read the current proposal and award policies and procedures guide, the PAPG. Um, if there is a solicitation, a program solicitation, read it, follow it, right? It's very important and it changes every single year. If you follow an old one, you run the risk of being returned without review because you haven't followed the guidelines. Uh, that is a horrible waste of time and energy. So let's say you have narrowed down the programs, you've figured out which one or two or three really seem to match your area of research. You've read the program page, you've read the solicitation, you've looked at the PAPG, you see what's required, you see if you're eligible for this particular program. But you really want to reach out to the program director to make sure, which is a good thing to do. The way to reach out is not to just cold call us because you will not get our full attention. Email a one or at most two page summary of the planned research project. Make sure to identify the intellectual merit and the broader impact, the, the two major criteria of review at NSF. Uh, we will give you feedback as to whether the project fits with our program goals. If it doesn't, we might forward it to someone else and say, do you think this fits with your program? It's really not my program. And if you've asked any specific questions, we'd be happy to answer them. If we cannot answer them by email, we'll set up a time to talk or to Zoom. And that way you have our attention for that amount of time, okay? Please email all of the relevant program directors and programs in one email. And that's typical for us because we really try and find the best home for you. So if you send something to me and it's not appropriate, and I'm going to send it to, let's say, developmental science, because I think it might be more them. And they say, oh, I think I've gotten this already. I got an email from this person. There's a lot of wasted effort, right? Just email us all at once. But if you haven't heard back in a week or two, please, you know, ping us again, because once the email falls below the event horizon, it can get lost. Some programs also often Zoom appointments, office hours, one-on-one -on -one with a program director, and they may have webinars posted as well. But all of that information is going to be on the program webpage. So common pitfalls and proposals, things that really sync proposals. If you don't include key aspects of the program announcement or the requirements, if you haven't followed the PAPG, that's a horrible thing, as I said, because it will be returned without review. Um, and sometimes that happens because you're relying on advice from people who do not work with the Social Behavioral and Economic Sciences Directorate, but work with other directorates which have other requirements. Or uh, you're getting advice from people who have only historical knowledge and haven't looked at the current requirements at the current PAPG and the current web pages, again, you can get returned without review because of that. Once things are reviewed, if they don't do well, common issues include not being specific enough about the methods that you're going to use or the data analysis plan, right? Just having a high level great idea, but not telling reviewers how you're going to go about testing it, and how are you going to go about statistically analyzing the um, observations that you make, that's going to sink a proposal. If your hypotheses are not clear, and um, you are not clear about how your potential results relate to the relevant theory, the relevant literature of the program that you're submitting to, then that's an issue. Often there's a disconnect in proposals. They might have great theoretical framing, a really good description of the experiments, 
but they don't fit together. Like the experiments are not actually testing the issues that are raised in the framing and the motivation, right? That's an issue. A big one is being so tunnel visioned about your own work that you don't consider the possibility of alternative results or alternative hypotheses, right? What else could your results mean? Or if what you're suspecting happens doesn't happen, what are the other possibilities that could happen and what would they mean in the context of the hypotheses that you're proposing? Another pitfall could be the failure to establish feasibility. This does not mean you always need to have pilot data. For us, at least, you, do, you don't. Um, but if you are proposing, for example, a new technique that you have never worked in before, and there's nothing, you've never published anything to show that you know how to do this particular methodology and use these techniques, then pilot data are very helpful. I should note that sometimes we get pilot data that doesn't actually support the hypotheses that the investigator is making. That's an issue. And it might be the, that the hypotheses are still valid, but the pilot data just has too small an N. It doesn't have the power. But make sure you understand your pilot data and can explain them when, propose, when including them in a grant proposal. Another issue is not tailoring the proposal to the appropriate audience. So is this an interdisciplinary program that you're submitting to? Or is this a more disciplinary review panel that you're, so you need to go more in depth within a particular literature? Is it the right literature for this program, right? Um, and then really important, those broader impacts, we take them very seriously. Why should the taxpayer care about your research, right? Even if it works out perfectly in the way you propose, why should we care? That's really important. What else are you doing to improve society through this work? So we do have two merit criteria, intellectual merit and broader impacts. Intellectual merit is the stuff most investigators understand sort of by osmosis, right? Potential for advancing knowledge. Is it creative? Is it original? Um, have you described the experiments well? And so on. Broader impacts don't have a clear boundary. It could be within the realm of training students, teaching, enhancing an educational experience, getting undergraduates involved in the work, um, how to enhance participation of underrepresented groups, what are the benefits to society? Are you changing or enhancing the infrastructure within your university or even in like local science museums or going out doing outreach, public un increasing public understanding of science? There's a whole bunch of things. But it not only has to be there, it has to be serious stuff. So if you say, I'm going to um, increase the number of underrepresented graduate students working in my lab, well, how are you going to do that? Have you contacted any relevant organizations within your institution? Are you connected to the McNair scholars, for example? Um, do you have a high school where the population is primarily underrepresented, underrepresented students? And can you do outreach there or lab tours? I mean, it has to be real. There is a Dear Colleague letter that's been posted that has information about broader impacts within the social, behavioral, and economic sciences. And I mean, the information there is helpful, I think. It's not an exclusive or exhausted list of possibilities. Uh, people can get very creative and do some really good things for broader impacts. We are always cognizant that this is taxpayer money, right? And we're trying to help society through better understanding of our science. So we're going to go to the question and answer period. Thank you very much. And as we do the questions, I think it would be really helpful if you start by telling me who you are and what your role is. So are you a faculty member in what department, what university? Um, so we know, are we talking in R1? Are we talking a primarily undergraduate institution? Um, are you an investigator? Do you work in the research administration and the sponsored research office and so on? And this is my email address. If you have any follow up co correspondence, I'd be happy to answer questions or pass your information on to someone who might be a little bit more relevant to your question. 
Thank you very much. Great. All right. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Betty, uh, for that uh, very informative presentation. And um, so, and also uh, we have uh, May Juan on to uh, answer questions. So we um, have uh, time for a couple here. So the first one is we got a lot on career. Um, do you know, does a career research proposal need uh, multiple prior publications and the topic by the PI? Uh, does the career in, and also significant preliminary data? Uh, yes, I would like to answer the questions. Um, and career awards or any NSF proposals, the prior publications is really to demonstrate that the PI has sufficient knowledge and skills that ready for the proposed research. So we don't really count how many prior publications in the related area the PI has. But they, from the uh, biologic, bi biographical sketch, we do be able to see that the PI's track record, whether the PI is in the right position to pursue the proposed research. And same for the mid-career advancement or other proposals. Okay, great. All right. And then another career question, are faculty in non-tenure track positions, um, for example, teaching track eligible for career or mid-career advancement? So um, the, the requirement for career is you have to have at least 50% on the tenure track appointment. And therefore, even though you are a teaching faculty, but if you have at least 50% on tenure track, you are eligible. Uh, for the mid-career advancement, we are actually specifically uh, tailored to faculty who are in the teaching position and would like to change their career direction to include research into uh, their career plan. So for mid-career advancement, though, there is no tenure track requirement. We actually in encourage people, uh, faculty are not traditionally on research uh, opportunities to, to pursue the research opportunities. Okay, all right, great, uh, thank you. And um, just one, uh, one more question, basically it, it's about contacting um, you guys. So how, what's the best way to contact the program director and um, what uh, you mentioned like a one page letter of inquiry, what should be um, in that? It's always a good idea for the one page letter of inquiry to sort of follow the project summary of a grant proposal. So basically, you're saying uh, what you want to do, why it's important in the broader theoretical frame, how you're going to go about doing it, what your broader impacts are going to be, why anybody should care. Right. So following the project summary is actually a really good idea. It gives the program director a quick idea of what you're hoping to do enough to know whether or not this is the right program for you and if not to give it to someone else and hopefully have them contact you if they're better suited great okay all right well i think we we pretty much got to uh almost all of the questions so that's fantastic i want to thank uh thank you very much to our presenters for an informative presentation so thank you so much, everybody, for joining us and take care and have a wonderful day.